Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of This Would Have Helped Me. Today I'll share with you my tips on how to win in game jams. Or at least how to get good scores. Because I personally haven't won a game jam myself, I'm still learning. And that's probably what I'm gonna be doing for another year or two. And that's probably what you're gonna be doing for maybe three or four years. But this, um, these are tips on how to optimize the learning curve and get the most out of every time you participate. So first of all, manage your time well. This is something I didn't do in the past, for example with my GM48 game Panic Attack. I ended up rushing it and uh, the game was bugged in the end and it was, wasn't very fun. Um, so here's how I managed my time for my latest project, Planet Doom. I started with um, just waking up in the morning and, think, and just uh, looking at the themes for the Lumidari and GM48 and then I just, just thought to myself before even turning on my computer um, what can I do with these, these themes? Uh, what idea? Can I... Can I uh, what game? Where I come to my computer, do a bit of game development, and then and then give myself a rest. I split this up into the main gameplay, uh, stuff like level design, menus, settings, pause menus. So basically, like the auxiliary gameplay, <laughs> music and sound effects, then art, then polish, and finally play testing and um, small details like balancing and pacing. Uh, then the next day after the jam officially ends. Um, of course, I submit it during the deadline, but the next day after the, the jam ends, I add, a, uh, I add screenshots, thumbnails, um, I improve my game page, I make it look pretty, all those things. A very important thing that um, many game developers fail to do and that Jonas Tyroller always, um, always tells everyone to do is to always have a finished game. By, basically, by the end of the this, this second point, uh, well, the third point, level design and menus and all that, you theoretically have a finished game. So, in that sense, you're basically never... Um, you're never stressed uh, that, that you, you have to continue developing because, because your game isn't finished. No, in the, during the first few hours, your game is practically done. And this applies not only to game jams, but to any game that you're developing. Same goes with uh, 1000 bit, although I didn't quite follow that formula. And I also didn't for uh, um, for Planet Doom, but I guess I'm not perfect. And finally, uh, uh, this is our, our kind of a rule that I invented, the three hour bank. <laughs> Basically, finish all of um, Finish all of your art and music and, and polish and everything three hours before the deadline and then ask someone else to play test the game, point out every single flaw that they see and then basically you have those those remaining three hours to make sure that uh, it goes from your state of finished to an actual state of finished because no matter how, how hard you try there will always be some flaws that you will miss. Uh, and also one more thing uh, that, I, um, that I wanted to mention is Vlambeer's 444 rule, which is that you have to make your main game during the first four hours and then you have the rest uh, of the time to add polish. Because polishing a game takes a lot longer than you think and Jonas Tyroller again has a great video on how long games actually take to make. <laughs> And all of this is to create a stress-free experience for your game jam, because contrary to popular belief, crunching doesn't actually help the, your productivity and, um, and the, the progress that you make towards your game. Because the more time you spend stressed and like uh, forcing yourself to be at your computer, the more time you're gonna spend like viewing uh, social media or not actually making any progress. That's why it's important to take take breaks, get enough sleep, eat well, and uh, stay positive. 
general like tips, um, exercise, maybe get a standing desk. Um, because the less stress you have, the more productive you'll be. And this, I, I tried this myself and it actually wor worked really well. And I did, didn't, honestly, at the beginning I didn't really think it would work that well, but it did. I ended up having time to do everything and I even had a three hour bank at the end. Um, yeah. Now my second tip is to be creative. This is, I, well, this is something I strive to do with every single one of my games, because we as indie developers have less um, resources than AAA companies, so we have to create good games by making them creative and innovative. That's our only way to cope, basically. Um, and besides, game jams are just exactly for, for the purpose of experimentation and trying something new. Except if you're going for uh, some prizes, because let's face it, that GMS license that costs four hundred dollars won't buy itself, and the GM48 does if you it for winning. <laughs> uh, so when you're experimenting, maybe try a different genre, one that you haven't tried before. Uh, maybe use a new game engine. You won't necessarily want to do that all the time. But I did that with the blind gem, which was um, a gem that I made myself, uh, and, I, and I learned how to use Unity in its in its core. Um, try a new mechanic. This is something that that I usually do. I just um, well a new mechanic or a new genre. Uh, maybe even something as minute as a different art style will separate you from the crowd. Um, and something that, that um, is important with game jams is that you learn something from them. So, for example, I um, in Planet Doom, it was the first time that I actually changed the angle of my camera. It's something that I've never done before. And I've also never done like a light, lighting shader or a bloom shader. Um, but when you're competing, then the, oops, then the most important part is probably just to stand out from the crowd. And besides, when you bring a commercial game, that's also your point. So a different art style is probably the, actually the first, most important point, even though people say, don't judge a book by its cover, that's usually what people do. That's, that's just the truth. How, now how can you invent actual good game ideas? Um, so, Nintendo has a way uh, that the first thing they ever do when they um, when they make a new game is that they think of how can we make this game different to play? Because after all, video games are the medium of interactivity. <laughs> That's why it, it kind of bugs me to see things like visual novels, because they're basically just books, but with, with some pictures on them rarely move <laughs> and and just the whole point of video games is that the player can interact with them that his choices matter in the long run so that's why um, gameplay is the most important part which I put there at the end um, by the way game makers toolkit has a great video on Nintendo's um, philosophy on game design maybe try giving the player a handicap once again GMTK has a video on snake pass which is a 3D platform without jumping. So maybe, so maybe try just taking away one of the player's core abilities and see what happens. This is also true for, for example, uh, what was it called? Um, there was there was some sort of platformer where when every time you jumped, you uh, you broke one of your legs, for example. Um, and not to mention all of the platformers without gravity, including mine, which was quite a quite a failure. What I like to do is, is to just keep a notepad file of all of my good ideas, which I come up with anywhere. I just I just have a revelation, then I just put it into a log, and then <laughs> if uh, there's a game jam whose theme meets one of my ideas, then I just slide it in. And that's a great way to, uh, to actually get to implement these ideas as well. Um, and if you're really desperate and you really can't, can't think of anything creative, then just work from a title or a theme or a limitation. 
Um, that's why Ludum Dare and GM48 and all those and many other game jams have themes to help game developers come up with a new way to play. Um, and finally, if you're really absolutely devoid of ideas, try the 50 games challenge, um, which uh, J once again Jonas Tyroller did. I'll mention that guy a lot of times because he's quite good. Um, he he did have 50 games in one day, I, I think it was 10 hours or so, um, challenge where, where he basically made one game every 10 minutes. And that way he was forced to create to, to kind of repurpose game ideas in new ways, or to come up with new ideas, which he said he wouldn't have come up with otherwise. So that's a very good uh, starting point. Next up, very important, make an accessible game if you want people to rate it well. Because hard games will give you lower gameplay ratings. It's weird, but it's true, because if People usually rate gameplay based on whether they enjoy the game or not, and if they if it's hard, then, then they won't. Um, but also have a high skill ceiling, because a too easy game will be boring. Uh, you basically want to keep the player in a flow state, and the best way to do this is to have some kind of adaptive difficulty system, so that the main game is quite easy to beat, <laughs> but you can get additional challenges. Um, but, but you can give the player additional challenges if, if they're up to the challenge. Next up, make the core idea of your game very intuitive and simple to understand. Um, and try to reflect it in your art if possible. That's what, again, Jonas Tyroller said. Um, um, that appeal is composed of good art, uh, um, an interesting fantasy, and art that complements that fantasy. It's important that your art reflects what you do in your game. That's why it's gonna be even more intuitive. If possible, if you have time, include a tutorial. That's what I've done in all my games since I don't even remember when. Um, and if possible, make it interactive as well. Um, exactly, make an in invisible tutorial, which once again, GMTK has a video on uh, Half-Life 2's Invisible Tutorial, and I think Snowman also has uh, has one on uh, Shovel Knight's Invisible Tutorial. Uh, of course, all these links to these videos will be in the description. And finally, game juice is crucial. That means screen shake, good sound effects, and particle effects. But do not overdo it, because you'll end up with this. Quite a few people suggested that I went overboard with the screen shake. But, I mean, you learn something new every day, don't you? And finally, the technical details. Don't make a game gamepad only. Publish it to as many platforms as you can. If you can make it HTML so that everyone can play it. If you're using GMS2 and you're exporting to Windows, Packaging, package it as a zip and not an installer because people will rate your game lower even though it's completely irrelevant. Uh, include accessibility settings if you can. That's something I forgot to do with, uh, or rather didn't know that I should do with Planet Doom. Uh, someone pointed out that they had epilepsy and that the error, um, like error flashes, um, were dangerous. So that, that's, that's an important detail that I didn't consider. And if you're, for example, multilingual, then include language settings. Um, for example, Jonas Tyrell worked with Luxflow and Prod on, on their Ludendari game. Uh, if they had time, they could have included an English and French translator. Uh, the fourth point is to keep the scope small. And this kind of ties in with keeping it simple. Basically, you won't have time to create everything you, you think about. So, just limit yourself to what you can do, and do exactly that as best as you can. Um, and this is just a similar point to that. Work within your abilities. If, for example, you can only make very low resolution pixel art, then go for it, and do it as best as you can, so that people will see your true potential. 
if you're very good at making puzzle games and you suck at arcade games, then make puzzle games. Although, that kind of interferes with the second point on creativity. So it's kind of more of a question, do you care about the ratings or do you care about trying something new? If you're a new developer, I strongly, very strongly suggest trying new things. But if you're rather experienced and you're looking for those sweet, sweet prizes, then, um, then do what you do best. The sixth point is also just rather only for people who want to go for the ratings. Get people to playtest your game before you publish it. Um, I did that with my brother for Planet Doom and he pointed out a few things that I wouldn't have noticed otherwise. And I can't even get started with the about 1000 bit. Like when I introduced my the playtesters to it, they pointed out so many flaws that I just wouldn't imagine that existed. Uh, for example, I didn't even know that you can use the home and end keys to move your cursor in a text editor. They pointed that out, so I added it. Um, so yeah, they will point out a lot of flaws that you wouldn't have noticed otherwise. And these aren't only bugs, these are gameplay issues as well, balancing issues, like I've mentioned in point one. Uh, pacing, also, you rather won't have time to do that in a game jam, but it's worth at least considering. And finally, after um, the creation process is over, give people meaningful feedback. Don't just tell them, oh, great game, I enjoyed it a lot. And like, that's nice, but it doesn't actually help them in any way. Don't point out obvious things, don't only say positive things. Tell the creator about every single detail that you didn't like. This is what I ask people to do in 1000 bit, and fair enough, they did it. And I'm very, very glad that they did. But for example, for um, for Swift Block 3310, uh, which I made for the Nokia game jam, every single comment that I got was I couldn't find any flaws in this game. And uh, moreover, I even saw some people in the Discord server talk about how they wish they would have made that game. Then what did I get? Eighth place. So remember, the ratings will be unfair to some extent. Like better games will get better ratings, but. There's there's some ambiguity. So, some people won't rate you 5 stars because they just didn't feel the game deserved it, even though they didn't find any flaws in it. So keep that in mind, don't, don't let yourself be overpowered with this. And finally, the last point, this will not guarantee you to win every single game game, but it will optimize the learning curve and help you learn faster from your mistakes. Which is also what I'm doing. So that's it. Thank you for watching this episode of This Would Have Helped Me.